Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Today is Monday, August 28th, and I'm winding down the last week here in New York City. It's been a fantastic uh, week here, month here, week. Been just an amazing trip. Weather's been perfect this week. Last week was balls hot, sauna-style fucking humidity. But this week is just beautiful, which is uh, pretty cool, man. I have not really experienced uh, New York City with this kind of weather. Just perfect, like 75, kind of L.A. weather, which is nice. Just cruise around in a T-shirt, maybe some jean shorts like a creep, <laughs> some jorts, as people were uh, commenting on my shorts on Instagram. Oh, you're wearing jorts. Yeah, man, that's right, waving the freak flag, as Mr. Jimi Hendrix would say. Anyway, loving you guys. Want to give a quick shout-out to all the uh, new donations on, um, on Patreon. Tommy Poro, uh, thank you. This guy, E.B., no name, just E.B., donated to the uh, podcast on, on Patreon. Anthony Ortega. Greg Frazier, Daniel, uh, Daniel Livesche, or Livesche. I fuck everyone's name up. I'm like, yeah, man, donate to the podcast. I'll give you a shout out. And then I just destroy your name. Hey, Daniel Lipshit. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, man. It means a lot and uh, keeps, the, uh, keeps the fire burning. Keeps the fire burning. Just got back uh, from doing a five-hour stint on Mr. Eddie Trunk's volume show and his Hair Nation show. Uh, another all-day Monday there, and I cannot thank him enough. That is fucking gold to be able to sit on Sirius Radio and just uh, talk rock and roll. I realize, man, that's really all I really want to do. I want to have a show on Sirius Radio, and I want to do stand-up every night in New York. I'm good with that, man. I'm good with that. It, look, it seems like an obtainable goal, but uh, who knows? I don't know who to talk to. <laughs> you know, everybody's like, hey, you ought to get a show on Sirius. Yeah, man, believe me. I love that. And uh, the more and more I'm there, the more and more I, uh, I dig the vibe, just hanging out, talking rock. So thank you, Eddie Trunk, and looking forward to seeing you out in L.A., uh, in the next couple months for the uh, Dio bowling uh, extravaganza at Pins, the Dio Foundation. Uh, and also thanks to everybody who uh, are new listeners here on Let There Be Talk. If you've uh, discovered me recently in the last few weeks from shows in New York or uh, on Sirius Ra Radio, welcome. Welcome. Which is a funny thing, I, was, uh, I just did my 300th spot last night for the year, and uh, I always try to, I, I, I used to make it to 500, 550, you know, I've been doing it seven and a half years, so I don't think I'm going to make it to 500, uh, I only got a few more months, who knows, you never know, could turn into a whirlwind of uh, insanity of shows, but uh, I hit number 300 last night. I did two spots last night. I did number 299 and number 300. And uh, I was talking about this on Instagram and Twitter today, but if you're, it, there's nothing more embarrassing than fans coming down to see you or people that like the Let There Be Talk podcast. I, never, I don't like to call them fans, just friends. Uh, fans just seem so weird to me. Like, hey, these guys are fans of mine. But um, people that dig the show... There's nothing worse than when they come out and then you bomb as a comedian. Because a lot of people are just like, I don't put anything up on YouTube because I want people to come out and see me. So they come out the first time and uh, it, 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 I don't bomb that often. But when I do, it's pretty fucking monumental. And uh, I used to blame it on the crowd like, oh, that crowd or oh, that those check drops or oh, blah, 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 blah. But uh, last night, some people came out that know me from the podcast. I was excited. 
They had come out to see me this Saturday night, but the show was canceled because of the McGregor fight. So they come last night. They sit front row, which, by the way, I always hate when people sit front row that I know because there's this, it, 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 it makes, it, you know, it steers my brain off. Like I keep seeing the people I know in the front and there is a, 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 a slight degree of performing and when there's somebody in front of you that you know, you're just like, this feels weird, which I think maybe uh, goes away as the better and better as you get as a comic and more and more that you're just yourself. But I know some of the big comics and I see they turn it up, you know, they turn up their personality. Yeah, they're their self and they're their voice, but they do have, uh, they bump it up a little, you know. So it's always weird to see somebody in the front. And then I start bombing, which I haven't bombed. I looked it up in about a year. I remember the last one. It was fierce. It was in the belly room. It was my own show. It was distortion. And I had, uh, I believe, uh, let's see, I think uh, Burr was on it. And then Joey Diaz. And then I went on and just ate salty dicks, man. Just fucking ate it. Well, last night, I, you know, uh, I, I always think, you know, oh, I've had a long, great run. Ooh, maybe I've got this. Maybe I know. Maybe I, I'm getting good at this. And then there's always a bomb sitting around the corner waiting to touch you on the shoulder saying, hey, man, you fucking, uh, you know, you're, you're not putting enough into it this week. Uh, you're running too thin. You're doing too many things. Uh, you're not paying a, enough attention to stand up and boom, this fucker punches you in the face. And that's what happened to me last night. And it's always a wake up call to sit down and go, all right, I need to see what the fuck's going on here. And I, I know, I know, you know, when you're in New York, man, you're trying to do as much shit as you can. Podcasting, serious radio, spots, uh, seeing friends, you're trying to get uh, everything in. And uh, that's when it fucking blows up in your face. Thank God that I had another spot an hour later and it was good, but it still wasn't fantastic. I got a lot of new material. And when I say new, it's about six months old, which is new in the comedy world. It already feels old to me. And it shouldn't feel old to me because I don't think that it's uh, all the way, um, all the way, uh, you know, it's, it hasn't been fleshed out. I should dig deeper into these premises and get more out of it. And that's what I think I need to start doing for now on, is sitting down and digging deeper into these things and just instead of just having these little vignettes of, of jokes. Uh, and New York's a different style. You know, it's a, a lot of set up, punch, bam, set up, punch, bam, 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 you know? So I need to just sit in it more because I like to... Uh, I like to take you on a little ride with these premises. So I'll figure it out. Yeah, it happened. But I figured, I think I did like 31 shows while I'm here. So one, one or two bad. Oh, well, you know, can't all be wins. If they are, you're probably doing something wrong. Anyway, thank you, all of New York City. I'm here one more week. And thank you so much, uh, everybody. The Stand, Patrick at The Stand. I can't thank him enough. Joe, Adele, everybody that works at The Stand. Uh, and also Stand Up New York. Uh, where else did I work? I worked at Gotham. I did uh, Caroline's. A lot of great stuff, but The Stand is just, The Stand is quickly becoming uh, my comedy store, East Coast, and I, I enjoy that family there. Very cool. Great to see Ari, Big J, Dan Soder. Uh, who else? My good friend Aaron Berg, who will be on this show next week, who has a brand new record out, so check that out on iTunes right now. I also got to do uh, quite a bit of fun podcasting while I'm here, including my guest today, which is a, a fantastic guest. It's funny because I had this man on years ago. Uh, when I had this podcast, I uh, did a little bit of it live from the Laugh Factory with cameras. And my guest uh, today is Wes Borland from Limp Biscuit, Also Big Dumb Face and Black Light Burns and many other uh, projects. I had him on and we filmed it at the Laugh Factory years ago. And he painted me while I was on stage. And for some reason, that episode no longer exists on YouTube. 
So I got lucky. I ran into him a month ago while I was in Detroit. And we decided let's do a podcast while we're both in New York. And it could be one of my all-time favorite episodes. I'm going to tell you that right now because this man has done something that uh, very few people have done that I know. Um, They've been in a band from the club level all the way to stadiums. And then, uh, you know, what happens after that, nobody is prepared for. You know what I'm saying? There's no handbook to tell you, hey, in about four years, you're going to make millions of dollars and you're going to be everywhere. It's a lot like winning the lottery, like that woman that won the $700 million last week. Uh, nothing prepares you for uh, superstardom. And he sits down with me and he tells, uh, tells all of us what that was like and what his life is like now, which is an incredible, honest, honest interview. And I do believe that this guy is one of the most... Uh, uh, original guitar players to come out in the last, I would say, 15, 20 years uh, that nobody talks about. There's an era of guitar players, and I talk about it on the podcast, where it seems to go Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, Yngwie, and, uh, and then it seems to stop there when people, people uh, talk about guitar gods. But what about Tom Morello or uh, Adam from Tool or, or you know, Wes Borland? And many guys like this that do uh, take the guitar to a, a completely different area uh, in music, you know? It's pretty incredible, just the sounds and, and the weirdness. To watch Wes play and to watch him write tunes and stuff is incredible. And I, uh, I watched him write tunes from the ground up on the Truth EP, and you're going to hear all about that here. Before I do bring him on, I just wanted to touch base. Uh, a little more people are asking me about the brand new Harley Davidsons, what I think. And let me get it way into that next week because I'm going to go to Elko and Harley and ride the new bikes. Um, of course, a knee jerk reaction when I first saw them was like, what the fuck? Uh, but then I had to sit down and really take a breather and think back uh, to over the years of uh, people that complain about everything. And this week, it seemed like people were complaining all week. You know, uh, either people love the Queens of the Stone Age record or they don't understand how Mark Ronson produced it. I think it's a genius record, Queens of the Stone Age. And uh, to think that a band should stay the same for their whole career is lunacy. And I love bands that take chances. All the bands I love have always taken chances. Go back to Zeppelin Three when people are like, what the fuck? Queens of the Stone Age record is absolutely fire, this new record. The reason I bring that up is there's all kinds of people complaining about different stuff all week. And uh, I always uh, remember the Sarah Silverman um, saying, stop complaining and be undeniable. And that's exactly what that Queens of the Stone Age record is, undeniable. Awesome. Uh, my point is, I remember in 2002 when Harley Davidson put out the V-Rod. It's the water-cooled uh, bike that looked like a, something out of uh, Tron. It had a motor that was built with Porsche. They worked on the engine for over, I believe, 10 years. They put zillions of dollars into it. And when it came out, the entire Harley communi uh, community shit on it. I remember specifically going over to Bob Drone's Harley in Oakland, California, and test riding it. My buddy, The Worm, who was the manager there, said, come by and ride this, Bill. I said, I'm not riding that fucking thing, man. I ride FXR, dude. I'm a biker. And uh, he goes, oh, I don't care. I just ride it. It's fucking crazy. I rode the bike for about eight minutes into the Oakland airport area where there was nobody around, punched that bike, and uh, I couldn't fucking believe it. Instantly bought the bike. I bought the bike in about 20 minutes. I sat down and said, I'll take that, and rode it all the way back to Los Angeles. I'll never forget it. And that was the last time that I questioned, uh, questioned bikes before I rode them. My point is everybody is an armchair biker when they saw the new Harleys this week where they moved the Dynas into the soft tail platform. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, 
just imagine, uh, you know, if uh, Chevy Ford trucks, Chevy and Ford trucks combined. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know how to describe it. Let's say, let's say they took the Dodge Demon and then they just put it in the Ford Pinto line. You'd be like, what the fuck are they doing? Hybrid and fucking, you know. My point is, the soft tails have not been selling for years by Harley. And they take one of the hotter bikes, the Dyna, and move it into the soft tail platform. Which, I mean, I'm, I'm, from what I'm hearing, my buddies have all rode this, and I'm going to ride it next week. They say it rides absolutely fantastic. And uh, they say it's next level. I don't have a problem at all with them uh, doing a hybrid model. I just wish they wouldn't call it the soft tail because all the blockheads from uh, all their life that know the soft tails as uh, not a good handling bike are like, oh, fuck those new soft tails. They should have called it something like the Dynamono or the MX, MX Dyna or, or just to get rid of the Dyna name altogether and do something. Uh, I don't know. My point is, I can't wait to ride it and be proved wrong like the V-Rod. I'm excited that Harley does do new stuff. Uh, they do do uh, some weird stuff. I do think there's some old guard in there still that uh, don't know. Um, they, you know, they pick weird paint schemes and stuff, but... You know, I've been through America, and I see who they're selling to. You know, there's guys out there with those rubber balls hanging off their uh, trucks, those, those ball sacks. So I'm like, oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Maybe they're the ones buying the uh, tribal paint job Harleys. <laughs> anyway, um, my point is Harley's probably never going to put out the FXR. I'm not sure why they don't do that. I, I absolutely love Tudor for mining their past. Same with Rolex recently putting out that uh, Daytona that looked like the Paul Newman. If you have the past and people love it, uh, put a special model out. Put an FXR CVO out. You know, take, take, uh, you can do whatever you want, but also give the people what they want. You know what I mean? Drive butts in the seats. Drive butts in the seats. Drive asses into the stores or whatever. Uh, you know, but I'll tell you one thing and it gets down to, uh, promote what's great and not what you hate. And that is nobody's talking about how fucking great Harley has hit it with this new motor from last year, which is carried over to this year. People are all like, Oh, I hate the new fucking bikes. Yeah. Well, guess what? There's 7 million used dinas out there. Go get one. I'm sure you're not even going to buy a bike. You're just online complaining. Fuck all this. Look, I'm not kidding you. There's at least 7 million used Dynas. You could go to Elko and Harley right now and go, I want a Dyna. I don't like the new ones. And they'll sell you a fucking shitload of them. There's a million used FXRs on eBay right now. I looked today. There's all kinds of FXRs. FXRTs, FXRPs. They're all out there. But to shit on a company that's been around for 115 years... Uh, I think they know what they're doing. Yeah, there's going to have some low points and some high points, but, uh, you know, they got to grow. Do I think the new bikes look that great? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not a fan of the Indians, and everybody's like, I'm going to Indian. I, I don't like the Indians at all. I don't like how they look at all. But I love the Harley Baggers, and the Ultra Classic this year and that uh, earth, earth-colored earth gray and the uh, CVO... Street Glide and the Battleship Gray, fucking bring it on. So stop complaining and uh, talk about what's great, man. We don't need the Harley Davidson Motor Company to go out of business. Well, that's the last thing we need. People just shit talking. And that's what the press, that's what the press has been doing on Harley for the last year. I don't know what the fuck they're doing, but they're just jumping on and saying like, Harley's in trouble. Harley's going down. Not true, man. Yeah, not true. You know, it's all clickbait. Anyway, that's my rant on Harley. Harley right now. Um, 
And of course, shout out to my sponsor, Harley Davidson of El Cajon, El Cajon Harley, the fantastic motorcycle sponsor. And if you want to go see these new bikes, maybe meet me down there. I'll be down there next week riding them, and I cannot wait. Uh, they've got them all on the floor right now. You can go in and test ride them. Go see my boy, Greg Riley, right now and ride one of these new bikes. Maybe you never had a Harley and you don't even know the fucking history, and you get on one and go, holy shit, this new bike kicks ass. Or maybe you finally want to get a bagger. Go in and get one of these brand new 2018 baggers, man. They got the amazing colors. The new Road King color is blowing my mind. It's like a silver and uh, like root beer color. I can't wait to see that. Anyway, Elko and Harley, great sponsor. And also my other sponsor is back, Catatonic. You know them. They make my stickers and they do shirts and they do toys, all kinds of stuff. If you're a small business or a rock band or a comedian or any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of uh, promotion stuff you might need or just a Christmas gift or birthday gift coming up, you could draw something on a napkin and Catatonic can make a toy out of it for you. Three dimensional. Check them out. Catatonic.com. Great sponsor. They made my uh, Grateful Dean stickers and I just love them. The quality is amazing and the dude is great, man. He is just unbelievable. Check it out. Catatonic.com for all your sticker needs or any kind of promotional material. If you're a business, like I said, you know, maybe you got a fucking coffee shop or maybe you're a bike mechanic or, or anything. Get a sticker and start fucking spreading them all over the town. Okay, let's get into it here from New York City. My good man, Wes Borland. Borland, how oh, we're are just you? ripping out of the gates. Yeah, off the bat. That's how we here do we it. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, or else we'll just sit here on the couch and talk the whole time. Yeah, ruin, ruin all of our, um, all the good, the the fat of the land. That yeah, we're gonna get into. I Sometimes guess. you miss the magic, as they say. Yeah, you know what of, I mean. Or you're talking and then you fire up the show and there and then you're like, so we were talking about earlier and then it's never good and organic. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are, New York City, man. Yeah, we, we just started talking about the fight last night that neither of us saw, but then you watched it and I overheard it in the coffee shop this morning. A couple of guys going like, it was his technique was mad, mad crazy, mad crazy. <laughs> he was funny looking, but man, <laughs> he it, was it, yeah. yeah. A couple of couch couch boxers, couch fighters couch fighters this morning in the coffee shop. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Like McGregor, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's been a fight with that much uh, conversation and hype and and uh, spectacle around it in, since like back in the days of Tyson. You know, where people were fired yeah. up. You know, that was yeah. pretty wild. Uh, you, you know what I was thinking about, like. Here we are in New York. We've been everywhere together. Isn't that weird? We've been a lot of places. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like we're we're in the Bay Area for a while while you're working on a record. Yeah, we went to Prague. Both great and miserable times. Yeah, for yeah. you. For me, you had a great time <laughs> both places. Yeah, yeah. But you made a film that no one will ever see. I guess. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, it's sometimes funny when you uh, tell people you do stuff and then it's not out there. They're like, this guy's a bullshitter. You know, I'm like, yeah, I made a yeah, film. But, but then you, if you fill them in, all it takes is two minutes to fill in the story and they go, oh, yeah, that's for real. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I, like I was, was hired to go make a movie for a band that was like, had already fallen apart. It was on the verge of like falling back together and apart at the same time. I don't, that was like trying to. I don't know, stack a house of cards in an earthquake. It was terrible. I loved it because here I am a guy, you know, um, I didn't really uh, grow up with Limp Biscuit. you know yeah. what I mean? I obviously am not an idiot, knew who the band was, humongous. But by then, I'm probably in my, uh, I don't know, maybe 30s, and I'm heavily into like, you know, alt country yeah. and uh and completely finding another world of music by then and and so then to be dropped into that was pretty interesting and also i had a uh a no uh what do they call like no sides or teams or anything yeah, yeah you're coming in completely unbiased like for people listening what we're talking about is dean del rey was uh 
uh, introduced to Limp Biscuit through. I'm looking up in the air because I'm trying to like <laughs> yeah, think yeah. about this. But Dean was introduced to Limp Biscuit through Ross Robinson, the producer extraordinaire. Yep. Um, and he came out with us to film us getting back together after having a really nasty breakup and in 2004 and trying to make a record and it um to say this in a very uh benign way the band wasn't ready to get back together yet <laughs> <laughs> so we have a uh, a kind of a an interesting behind the it scenes. It wasn't really a train wreck, and it wasn't really a... Because I think that we did a bunch of cool stuff. It's I agree. All, all, no, like, all parties involved, including myself, were not ready to get back together and work together again. We still yeah. had a lot of uh, resentment, and, um, you know, it's it's. I think that some cool things happened, but... Some things are better left for the shelf, I guess. Yeah, I don't, you I know, don't know. It was so interesting to be uh, not knowing anything. And I do know one thing that I took away from it, and it is um, the level of how there's no handbook to tell you what the fuck's going to happen when you explode the size of a band of Limp Bizkit. Uh, you know what I mean? How... Can you handle that as a human being and be normal? It's almost impossible. Well, Can I'm you still like dealing with it now? Like it's still a weird thing. To yeah. Do now. yeah, yeah, I believe that because whenever I'm around you, I do get a little bit of uh, uh, like uh, maybe not child actor thing, but some shell shock. Like wow, man! Like just a <laughs> you're shot out of this cannon. Yeah, it's just a weird thing to like. I guess we were signed when I was 21, and I didn't grow up with any money um i grew up you know like scraping together a guitar amp and a guitar and was always like you know trying to work jobs or like at 12 to 13 i was like mowing lawns and mowing lawns and bagging ice for like yeah. an hour at the grocery store that they were like illegally letting me work at <laughs> to make a little bit of money to buy an 80 dollar guitar and an amp and that was like the best thing i ever got i still have it actually you do yeah same, that first guitar but um it's uh, it's really weird to I I've sort of analyzed it a lot and now I'm I'm 42 now so it's I'm twice the age I was when the band started and it's um. It's just an odd thing to, sort of, revive yourself from Arrested Development. Right. I guess. Like like I was so, there are parts of me as a person that never matured as an adult right and and i'm now having to play catch up with some of those things you know like um just think about reality like <laughs> what reality is yeah and like and like everybody's place in it and it, it it's like undoing a bunch of the stuff that i sort of did to myself or that whole experience did to me um i'm in no way um like a messed up guy right i think you know i think i never had a drug or alcohol problem um i never was like wild that wild on the road i i just um well there's uh, there's you know, other I, things it's, it's, it's adrenaline it's, and and uh and uh insanity that most people i don't think go through ever you know what i mean yeah, i mean i hate the whole i always hated the whole fame thing right and i never understood um, I never thought the whole any of it was going to happen in the first place. I was like, "Cool, we'll be a, you know do a band for a while, and that'll be great, and be able to you know then I'll go to to college like I was planning on you know, right, after right. a couple of years." Yeah, and um, that never happened. But you know, when you're on the top of the world and then you're not, um, you know, years later, it's it's a weird adjustment, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a weird adjustment to to sort of take all of the things that you went through and put them in perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I definitely witnessed it with uh, a lot of those '80s bands, and I think what you have going for you or your band was it wasn't a one song 
boom flash in the pan because i think that's really where people get uh complete and if you look at these uh these vine people i don't use star after it because that's lunacy but these vine people or these um all the people let's say on jersey shore Mm -hmm. uh that show or any kind of reality stars uh they they, you know, they're somewhere for a minute and it's almost going to be way worse for them on the backside, you know, oh, but yeah, with sure. you guys, yeah. you were definitely big for years and years, but think about like, I know a lot of eighties guys and you'll see them. Uh, I call them hair metal tumbleweeds. They're just blowing around yeah, Hollywood yeah, yeah. and they're just like, Whoa. And you're like, Whoa, that guy was like in, uh, you know, Tora Tora or something, you know, yeah, bang tango. Yeah. Like bands that had a video and maybe one song and then just, it's like, wow, you know? And I think also what that has to do with is, uh, People think they're just going to be at one uh, level forever. Mm-hmm. I don't know why they ever think that because you can just see what happens. It's up and oh, then yeah. it's. Oh, yeah. It, there's, you know, it, the history's in the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. For years, but every, it happens to everybody. Yeah, you know? they're like, not me, though. I'm just going to keep having hits like, uh, you know, fucking uh, Jay Z or something, you know? I mean, yeah, there's I very know, few. Peter Gabriel and just keep Sting. Yeah, yeah, and have a draw forever. I mean, Sting's an immortal vampire, so you can't. You know, he's, out, <laughs> he's in a different category of, of person. You know, he's been alive for hundreds of years. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I believe that. He, he, yeah, I mean, so I mean, what do you? How do you gonna? How are you gonna follow that? And <laughs> actually, like, romance him and get him to bite you and drink his blood. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you got to look at it. I definitely could see that there was some, uh, it was hard for you because you left the band, what, two, three times, right? Um, I think two times. Mainly it was the, but mainly it was the one where I was just like, I can't take this anymore. You know, fuck the money, fuck everything. Like, I can't, um, I can't be subjected to this kind of um, insanity. Insanity anymore. I mean, I can't, like, have. Because I think the, the, what happens is you, I became a part of creating a public persona that right. wasn't really, it's not, I, I mean, I just play like a small part in that because it's also everyone else's idea yeah. or, you know, presentation or, you know, the, the way that they are, you know, viewing whatever's going on and also writing about me. And that was a weird time where people were like, whenever a band gets big enough, there's these really strange um, folks that uh, maybe they're not strange. Maybe they're just totally normal, but they write fan fiction. Oh yeah. And I was getting all these like people sending me stories they'd written about the band or about, it, it was just bizarre. Just yeah, this like, people get like, way in there, way huh? into it and just like get in a whole dream world of like thinking about, People and I was just like, "This is gross. I, <laughs> I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to. I don't want to be in magazines. I don't want to be because. But when you're first, like, if you haven't ever been in a magazine or been famous, it seems like it's going to be awesome. You yeah, know? and it's just weird. Yeah, you're like, "Fuck, I'm on the cover yeah, of like this is great. I'm on the Stone cover. Or and, and then and then you're like, "I don't want to be. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I don't want to be yeah. like." tricked into the photographer telling me to like make a certain pose and we won't use that one we just have to get it you oh. know, like that whole thing <laughs> where they that, act like idiots we won't use it but that'd be funny and then they be like and then that's the one they yeah. use you know to where you get to the point where you're like shutting down photographers and going like i can't do that because that's the one you're going to use and they're like yeah. that guy's a dick yeah yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know, it's these like, guys are hard to work with yeah hard to work with yeah. so um i don't know it's 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 my life now is just sort of trying to, I just, um, my wife and I have a label, uh, that, and we just got distribution through Sony red, the orchard, uh, for, so we're, we're, we went from sort of just doing our label through tune cord and now we have, you know, legit international distribution and, um, they're really great over there. And I basically sat down with these folks and said, look, well, I'm interested in, um, making tons of different records and also signing um not signing people but putting records out because i well, i'm not going to say i'm going to sign a band because i'm not right, i right, put a record right. out yeah. for my friends or people i like or people whatever. that make records at, at the house that uh should be out yeah yeah i'm going to make records uh with people i like and and make records 
for me and uh and do my own records and um i basically said if i do uh if i give you guys setup time will you promote it and they were like yes we'll help you promote i said if i give you one week to put a record out will you put it out with no promotion they said yes we'll do that too wow i said and i can do as many as i want a year and they went yep so wow so that's what i'm doing now wow so i'm i'm really interested in being in a place where i can just make music i you know my wife and i moved to detroit and set up a huge studio there and um that's where i'm at i'm making i'm i'm painting in a painting studio that i have at home and i'm making you're about to have a show right um, you got, like, I'm I, halfway done. It's it's. I'm doing 20 huge canvases that are all. I saw some of them. Yeah, they're all women sitting in the same position. Those are the parameters. They're all four by six foot canvases, um, all oil, all women in the same position. Um, but that's where the similarities end. So right. everyone's different, you know, ethnicity or clothing, different pose, different things in the background. I've started to put paintings in the paintings to where there's paintings in the backgrounds. Um, but that's all taking, I was trying to give my, I give myself these really short time parameters, like, like windows to do something. And sometimes I hit them and sometimes they're just a good target to shoot for. Yeah. 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 And I'm realizing that the painting thing, I was going to try to finish by the end of the year and make three records this year. And that turned into, I'm going to get half of them done this year and make two records this year because it's just not enough time. Yeah. Because I'm also um, starting to take on some scoring stuff, um, which is has definite dates because there's other people involved in that. So, um, that, What are they, TV or movies? or? Um, it's, it's a couple of different projects that I can't talk a lot about gotcha, now because yeah. they're not solidified. Um, and the, I also can't publicly say that I'm involved with them, but, um, yet, but, uh, yeah, those are, there are other people involved in them and those will have definite like yeah. dates when I need to, that's you know, rad when I need to hit. So yeah. Cause your new solo record, it's definitely has some, uh, soundtrack kind of score vibe to it. Oh, you know, thanks. I listened to the new record and, uh, crystal machete mm-hmm. and, you know what I thought of it? You sent me the vinyl, and um, I listened to it, what it does for me as a, uh, like a melody and, and, and lyric writer mm. is I like to, it's like a blank canvas for me to where I go, where would I go with this as a singing Oh, style. as a singer, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, it's interesting because I'll hear stuff and... And there's tiny little bits of vocals that are like vocoder or robot Right, right. But I'm, from here, like spiced throughout, but right. mostly it's instrumental. Right, exactly. Yeah. And for me, I'd be like, oh, oh I would kind of sing this. On. It's a good inter- uh, exercise for me just because I don't really play music anymore. But I would be like, it kicks that gear up. Oh, that's know? good. Yeah, to where I'm like, oh, where would I go with this? If somebody dropped this on me and said, mm-hmm. hey, we need the 10 songs done, you know? Oh, cool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, uh, it's a thinking record. Like, it, I made it because I wanted, I like listening to things that make me think and work that don't yeah. have, that aren't um, intrusive or aren't, um, there's so many belligerent records that are just like unpolite like in your like trying to get your attention and the obvious records yeah they're just so obvious yeah you know what i mean i wanted to make a record that was good for people to um a a record that was sort of like a catalyst to help people work on art or work on whatever they're working on you know how long it take you to do that record that was a five weeks five weeks from from start to final mix and and you were just kind of because it's way different than uh black light burns and uh big dumb face Mm -hmm. Um, Both of which I'm doing those. I'm doing a Big Dumb Face record now, wow. and then doing the follow up to Crystal Machete, which is called the Astral Hand. Um, which is the Astral Hand is referenced during the song Crystal Machete. So this is like a, it's just a continuation of the same thing, and um, and it'll have the same parameters, like no distorted guitar, no um, vocals that aren't treated somehow, right. um, and I'll do it in a short period of time all by myself with no help. Um, and then I'm doing a new Black Light Burns record, third. Oh, that's so. cool, man. I mean, because, you know, when you look at, you you know, uh, uh, what I love is, and I, and I do, I, I want to ask you this question, because when you're inside of a box of uh, Limp Biscuit 
I would say, and this is, uh, I know a lot of people say, watch out what you get famous for, because that's what you're going to be known for. Yeah, yeah, yeah for and sure. And somebody really told me that early on uh, when I was doing my comedy, and thank mm -hmm. God they did, you know, um, because I was just, you know, kind of not really doing comedy my voice. I was just like, what about Winnie the Pooh? He doesn't wear pants. It's like, yeah, I yeah. don't even know why the fuck. I know? remember that joke. Yeah, right, yeah. right. You know, but that's early on. Yeah. And somebody was really honest to me, uh, Ian Edwards. He's like, man, that material is bullshit, you know? Uh, I'm not saying Limp Biscuit's bullshit, but what I'm saying is your brain and mine, too, when I talk to people, they tend to only gravitate towards, like, the 10 80s guys I've had on this show, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where that, it was just one block in my life and they're missing like all the pieces here where I'm talking about art or painting or architecture yeah. or uh, incredible different types of music. Like mm -hmm. for me, alt country is way bigger in my life uh, at the time than 80s rock, you know? I like like three 80s bands, Jane's Addiction, Guns N' Roses, you know, Motley Crue, those are like the ones, you yeah. know? Um, but, P, you know, what I'm getting at is when you put this stuff out, I'm sure that the average Limp Bizkit fan is going to be like, oh, what is this, you know? Mm -hmm. But hopefully it get, it finds other people, you know? Because what I find with you and I don't think a lot of people know this, is you have so much depth, which is awesome. You know what I'm saying? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, it's interesting what Limp Biscuit is, the whipping band. They got the whipping band, you know. And you guys were like a rap metal band, and you celebrate rock stardom and all that, like rap does. And rap doesn't get any whipping when they're like, you know, big baller, bling city, rims, all that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, it just, you know, I think context is everything. Right. You know? And that, that some people can do. Like, I, I just saw, we went and saw, it was Curry's birthday yesterday. We saw the Book of Mormon. And right. There, there's a bunch of jokes in that, that if they were in different context, um, they would be more than offensive. They would be like career ending right. for some people. Right. Like some of the jokes in that, in that um, musical. And I had, uh, before we went to see it, I told my mom, I was like, I was like, I'm going to take Corey to see Book of Mormon. She doesn't know it, but I'm, you know, I got like front row tickets and we're going to wow. um, see it on her birthday. She was like, oh, I loved it. It was so good. I was like, really? I heard it was offensive. And yeah. she was like, no, I loved it. And then we saw it. And afterwards I went, Mom, I cannot believe you liked this because my mom's a first grade teacher. My dad's a and you come from minister. a heavy religious yeah, he's, yeah, family. Yeah, they're they're religious people, and she was like, "Oh, get out of here!" I saw the vagina monologues, and I was like, and she goes, "And your dad couldn't hear half the jokes." Yeah, and I was like, "I think maybe you couldn't hear half the jokes too because it was." <laughs> but yeah. you know, context is everything. Yeah, it's just like they they somehow when you set a joke up in the right way, and then you have like Kramer. Yeah, like, the, like what's his face? What's yeah, his name? Yeah, yeah, for uh, Michael Richards. Michael Richards with that whole dropping yeah. the end bomb and melting down on stage, like you can't do that. Yeah, like, you know it's 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 just, but somehow some people can get away with you know just like elegantly making a racist joke or, or yeah. you know making a a completely un PC joke, and um, I think that that's that was what happened with Limp Bizkit in some ways, you know, there, I think that there was a real obnoxiousness and it, it also kind of, again, it was the, it was what was put out there into the world. You right. have to be careful with what you put out there because you're only part of what you're doing. Right. You know, everyone else also makes up what you're doing because the way that, the way that people perceive you people mold it a different way they mold it a different way and they look at it a different way um and and i mean i don't think people should edit themselves too heavily but they should be aware that whatever you're putting out there is going to you only have a, a certain vote in yeah. how it's going to look or what's going to happen because the whole Woodstock thing, yeah. The whole like you know the way that that was. We weren't there for most of the the day, the, the burning when everything started burning and stuff. Right. But 
But on the news, when you take, when you condense everything that happened in Fred Woodstock, Ryan, the pie, b- pie with, then the fires. Yeah, because that's it what they have to do. They have to condense it to show, like, this is our story, you know, and, and they want to, they want ratings, they want a story, which is fine. And I'm not saying that what happened during our set was okay, because apparently there's like a bunch of people getting beaten up and alleged rapes, which, you know, that's yeah. just outrageous. Like when you're on stage, you have no idea anything like that's happening. Right. Everything just looks like it looks like everybody's having a good time. Um, but I think that that package packaged along with like a bunch of the other incidents that went down and then, um, you know, Fred really embracing celebrity and try, and kind of like do being cool with like the Us Magazine type and, you know, right. the tabloid sort of. Uh, look, that all together just formed this like bad taste in everybody's mouth. Right. You know, for that period of time. It, 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 when you're behind the scenes on that, are you like, oh, we're fucked? Or are you just going through it with blinders on? I just didn't want to be a part of it anymore. Like, I didn't, I didn't, that's why I walked away from it. It's because I just, I, I didn't want to be part of that. Um, and it was too late because I will always be part of it, you know. Yeah. But I, at that time, I was like, "This is not what I signed up for. I don't want to do this. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to participate in other people's opinions of me." I guess. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you know, when you're looking at, um, when you're looking at that era, man, it's like, it's it's almost. Uh, it's so fucking big. It's like a circus, right? It's yeah. just like. And and a lot of that is almost the early uh, TMZ clickbait where, where that's starting to bubble up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Which is definitely the garbage of America. I really think that, like, you, you know, that's one thing I notice about New York. And I think one thing that really I love about New York is... There's no Kardashian wannabes here. Nobody looks up to the Kardashians in New York, Mm -hmm. where in in middle America and L.A., which is real. And I love L.A., but man, people think that those people are something great. And I'm just like, wow, man, this is fucking crazy. They've created nothing. Well, they, yeah. Like, well, they're like royal. They're they're our version of the royal family. It's you know? horrible. You know yeah. what I mean? It's weird. In New York, you don't walk around. You don't feel that at all. There's no one going like, yeah. No, it's a different. I mean, New York is. It feels like. It feels like reality. It feels you know? pure. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah, you know, they'll call you out on bullshit. Nah, that's yeah. bullshit. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you, you know, I remember uh, specifically a story when I was filming you guys that I had no idea about. But when you guys signed a record deal and you were going out to do the record, you were in a van and it crashed. I wasn't in the band then, actually. Oh, you weren't in the band, no, yeah. I wasn't in the band or the van. Wow. <laughs> now, that's a crazy story, right? Like, they're going mm-hmm. to do a record and they, they're in a full-blown crash. Yeah, they had a guy driving who fell asleep at the wheel. They were driving, like, all night. From Florida to L.A. to do yep, the record? Yeah, they had signed a record deal and they had two guitar players in the band that weren't me, that were friend of uh, other guys from another band in Florida. And um, they, uh, I, I, have, I was out again. I mean, I, the first, that was the first yeah. time I was like, not doing this, goodbye. Yeah, yeah, and, no, because that's in the early club days. Yeah, yeah, in the early club days and when we were doing like, we did like Deftones tour and a House of Pain tour and we're just doing like little things. And, um, yeah, I was like, I, I'm just going to go to college. I don't want to do this. Yeah. And um, I mean, there's been several times I didn't want to do it. And I know like people think that I'm like a quitter or on the fence or right, whatever. But, right. you know, it's always been I've, I've always I guess in some ways I'm difficult to work with for that yeah. reason. Because you know? <laughs> I, I want things to be a certain way. And if they're not, I don't want to do it. Right. So because I, you know, my time is valuable and I also feel like. Um, you know, it's just life is too short to like get cooped up in something that you don't want to do. Yeah. You know, I'd rather work a square job than, <clears throat> than, um, and I guess that was a tale, like my reluctance to do it was sort of a, you know, 
foreshadowing of what it was going to become in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, hey, get ready for this. <laughs> yeah, you know, because I, cause, and I was right. I shouldn't have, I, there, I, I wish that <clears throat> a lot of the time that I'd never um, been in the band or been in a successful band at right. all. You know, I, I don't know what life would be like now, and I definitely think that... Um, well, you'd be like me. I've never been successful, but I've always done art. And at the end of the day, people are like, oh, you know, aren't you kind of bummed you never made it? And I'm like, I already did make it. You know what I mean? I'm 51, and I'm doing stand-up comedy in New York City. Well, you're doing really well. I <laughs> well, you know, but, but I'm talking about there is that fear of blowing up because you can only go down. And there's something about uh, people, they love to build you up and mm. champion you yeah. and then when they get you there they go ah fuck that guy you know which is really yeah, int- because people get they want it's it's an all you can eat salad bar until they want to throw it then they're throwing up back into the salad bar yeah. you know they're just like i don't want it anymore they're like oh not this guy again yeah disgusting but i've i've always since i was a kid had the same and when i say a kid like a teenager like what what i wanted to do was the first thing I wanted to do was special effects, makeups, makeup and movies. That's all I wanted to do. Right. I wanted to, I wanted to paint and sculpt and go to school for that. And my, <clears throat> my vision and idea of success has never changed since day one. And that was, I want to be able to do um, exactly what I want to do and, and make enough to sustain myself on it. Right. And that's it. I want to, I want to be able to, um, get food and clothing and put a roof over my head and be able to do whatever it is that I want to do to love my job and to be able to put away some savings. And that was my thought in life. Like that's what, that's success to me. Right. And the, the whole band, like band blowing up thing was just like, I don't know. It was like a a candy store vomiting on you or something. (laughs) It was just like way too much (laughs) and way too, you know, it was. It didn't feel that low level of success is not pure to me. Right. It's not like, and now I'm sort of like balancing out. It's hard to to go back and sort of balance out that original idea of success when you have like the looming past. Yeah. You know, over yeah. you. But um, little by little, every record I make, it like even chisels it, out. it away. Chisels right? it away, little by little. I'm I'm like chiseling out my, you know, uh, my version of what successes you know you know uh i you did black light burns you did a a video for that and i was in the video yeah and um i get a lot of visions of your art throughout the years that we've known each other and that one thing that video and uh the woman that did it uh what's her name i got her yeah Mm -hmm. it was incredible the vision of it man it was just like when we were shooting the video, I'm there like we're. Just, I'm like, what is this? You know, we're just in some old abandoned warehouse. I'm seeing all this weird stuff that you have, an octopus chair or whatever. And then when I see it, I go, this is incredible. I can't believe that that video didn't get like two million hits. You know, I, I mean, know, it is man. it it's, is smoking. Well, yeah, thanks. I think the one even before that was was even better, which just like with the ocean, like you know, where I could be the under beach. the ocean with a scuba diver and like be under the water for a really long time and then come out. It was, I mean, there, that was, it, it's funny because it's, that's sort of like the time we live in, like a, a lot of stuff doesn't get, um, doesn't get the chance to like really you right. know, explode or bloom or whatever. I think Blacklight Burns has done, really well for right. what I, for what it was and for what um you know what my expectations were it definitely passed i thought it was great what my expectations were going to be as far as like we were able to do after that we we did like a full like european and russian tour and had like a bunch of really great turnouts and some sellouts on that tour and it was just um and came home like having made money which was the, right. for the first time yeah yeah we actually went out and came back with money in the bank which and not in the hole which is almost impossible for people to do now you yeah know? yeah like I'm, being in being in my wife's band i play guitar in my wife's band too what's the name of the band uh, queen kwong yeah and um Karay's band just sort of like 
like the way like watching not only how tough it is for for a working band nowadays but to see um the music industry through the eyes of a woman in the music industry it's like so much worse yeah, you know like right? just the mal chauvinism and the double standards and like it's just uh it's a really tough time for bands right now. Yeah. Know? And, and uh, that's one thing I guess I have to be grateful for is Biscuit was like one of the last bands to actually. That's what we were saying. It's like the true make, last yeah, to actually make money. record sales, multi, multi platinum, yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, you know, money in the bank and stuff. At one point, was it just massive money? Like, whoa. Yeah. Like a ridiculous amount of money. And, and all of my money got really like, aggressively invested in the stock market is that right like high-risk stocks yeah and then who did that for you oh that was the band's accountants he was just doing that on oh without yeah aggressively invested without asking money. no 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 oh yeah i got no, i was into it I oh was, yeah because at that time this is one of the things this is one of the the ideas of arrested development is because i was just like this, like you said, when you're in it, you think it's never going to end right. because people are just stroking your ego and, you know, going, this is, you guys are the best thing ever. And, you know, we're, you know, this ride is never going to end and positive, 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 you know, the buzz is on. And then you're like defeating boy bands on TRL. We, I mean, we felt yeah. like, we felt like gods, you know? And, and so I was just like, yeah, man, invest it all. Yeah. You know, like, we're, like if we lose it all, who cares? There's more where that came from. Wow. But that's, you know. And did you lose it? All of it, yeah. All it, of it. 9-11 happened. Yeah. And I lost, like, I don't know, well over a million dollars in the stock market. Just, like, poof, gone. Wow. Just poof, gone. Right. And, and, yeah. and what's crazy is I was just like, whatever. Oh. <laughs> but I had, like, nothing. Like, that was all my money. And I was like, I was like. Oh. Don't worry, I'll make we'll make more money. And what? then I was like, actually, I don't want to, and I quit. Oh my it, god! It was, so you quit, and you have no money at that time. Yeah, and they were like, they told me, um, it was so. And I look back on this, it's just like, God, you're an idiot. And and everyone listening to this will think I'm an idiot too. But this is how like hard headed I I am and was at yeah. the time. Is uh, they were like, all the money's gone you know, you lost all your money in the stock market. We have touring set up next year and you're going to make, you're going to net 5 million next Whoa. year. Whoa. And I said, you can shove it up your fucking ass. <laughs> and I said, I'd rather be poor. Wow. And left. Wow. And left. The, the, I was in the management office and the, they were just like, okay. Wow. Yeah, just totally. I'm like the most hard headed. Yeah. Jerk. <laughs> idiot now know? when you look at it the other dudes are uh were they broke too Beca yeah, because yeah. Every, now yeah you're everybody's walking. money was kind of invested in the same way and so they're looking at you and they're going fuck we need him uh to do this tour maybe i'm not sure because i just cut off all communication right. and when you cut up when you quit that time uh, you're living in la i think over in los Feliz, yeah. right mm -hmm. and does and then what 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 was your day-to-day -day life like? Were you just kind of like, ah, I'm just sit around the house? No, or? royalties were still coming in, so I was just like, I, I, I immediately went and got, um, tried to get off of Interscope, and yeah. they, they were like, no, we're gonna hold you as an artist. So I tried to start another band, um, and started looking for a singer for right. the band, and just went into, like, basically just worked on a record that, excuse me, worked on a record that they wouldn't. Um, move forward on and it got shelved we which were, record was that it was a band called eat the day and we did a we did a which is a terrible name but that was like the working name of the band right um and we did worked on a record for two years that they wouldn't move forward with and, wow and it's like while they're like looking for a guitar player i was looking for a singer right and listening to just all these demo tapes and it was and we had like two or three people that that kind of made it a little ways that we were writing songs with but the label just didn't want to work with anybody. What was the direction of the band? Um, it basically sounded like it was kind of like a like tool or something. Like it was really self-indulgent right. and, and avant-garde and really long songs. And I mean, there was definitely some cool material, but it was wrong. You know, it was I, I was in the wrong headspace. I was like thinking like I'm 
like like lightning in a bottle. I I, <laughs> I poop out lightning in a bottle for breakfast. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, was, I was like, you know, I, I can make anything big. Yeah, I can make anything big. You know, I'm 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 blah 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 blah. And so it was a real lesson in in um, humility, right? You know, to to work on something and not have people be interested in it. You know, not have the label falling all over themselves and not having them, you know, excited about it. I had Jimmy Iving come in and listen to the stuff and he was just like, eh. Right to your face? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it was just like, and he goes, and he goes, you know who needs to be singing for this band? Trent Reznor. Oh. And, I, and I was just like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, why would you even, who, who, <laughs> why would you even he, say that? He'd be singing, like, with, yeah. And, I, and he was like, you never know. You never know. And I was just like, oh, Okay, well, that's not going to happen. So then I was like, I did a bunch of dumb stuff. Like I, I was, I was working with Gavin Rossdale from Bush for a while. Really? Yeah. And and then did you uh, you play with Marilyn Manson for a minute? That was after I this because because during this period I went I was out of Biscuit for four years doing right. different stuff or three years and then that's when I met you. And yeah. Went back and tried to. Because the whole time they were like, we're not going to release your record. You need to go back and do stuff with the band. They did was, that on purpose, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was being held. That's some evil hostage. label yeah. stuff. You know, because, you know, when you find out, there, like, I wish there was a documentary on the evils behind labels. Yeah. Because they just go like, well, this is our cash cow limb biscuit. We need Wes in. Well, Wes doing a solo record. I don't care. We're never putting that out. Yeah. He's going to starve out, and eventually he'll come back, and we'll get this That's money exactly machine going. That's exactly what they did, yeah. So they just held me and held me and held me. But it wasn't like um, – I still had a, like a trickle of money coming in, so it, it wasn't like I was – I did, it wasn't a ton, but it was enough to get by on. Right. And, and, um, and enough to be able to work on music. So, I mean – shit it was a lot like now there's like <laughs> yeah. now it would be like holy shit you know this is like we have a fortune to work with but then, <laughs> but then it was just like enough um to get by because i'm still like coming off of like the the i mean because you got to understand like those are old days 10 yeah, million yeah, records it, it, it's like coming off of you know lifestyle because now like i fly I, I fly coach all the time now to save money because yeah and, and i don't care but then we were flying first and private exclusively all the time yeah yeah you know so six grand uh fly yeah forget it grand. man it was just like whatever then but but coming off of that it's it takes a little while to like go whoa that's not happening anymore you know <laughs> like like <laughs> it was it, yeah, like, yeah. like it takes a little while to go like whoa i have to adjust my <laughs> i love the honesty of that you yeah. had it kind of made though because you were always in costume so you could really fly coach and no one would even oh know. no 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 people i i was not always in costume oh like, i got you because i did a bunch of interviews out of costume oh i got you so yeah, unfortunately yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm just saying, like, you know, like, you could sit next to a lot of people and they wouldn't be... Yeah, like, but I, I cared then. I don't care now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Most people don't care now. So yeah. it's just like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> now it's just like, dude, I'm saving money. What are you talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Saving money. Yeah. I'm, I'm middle class, man. Yeah. It, well, it, it's... That, to me, it, and you said it uh, correct, you guys were the last big fucking smasher boom, you know? And... Uh, it's just like most bands won't ever have to deal with that. They're never going to fly first class, maybe unless they do a corporate for Monster or something yeah, by accident. Something you know, like that. yeah, but it'll be one yeah, time. It's nuts. It's nuts. The yeah. whole thing's nuts. It's it's just it's a terrible thing to ever be involved with. Yeah, because I think they would be good to. I guess it's like in some ways it's sort of like a heroin addiction because if you get if you get on heroin early in life and then you have to live without heroin, you're like always you're. Yeah, it takes a it's a big adjustment for people to to go. Oh my God, you know I can't do heroin again. I think that's a a, a huge thing that's happening to me now in my fifties, of um, especially with shows, uh, mm -hmm. live concerts. When I'm at a live concert, uh, or you know, newer bands really get me off. Like say Rival Sons or something, where I'll be like, Oh my God, this is fucking great, or mm -hmm. you know. Uh, all them witches these bands i see you know but when people go man that was great right i'm like I, you know i grew up 
I saw Van Halen on the Fair Warning tour and Women and Children. You know, I saw ACDC yeah. on the Power Age tour. Yeah. I saw Ted Nugent on the D- Double Live Gonzo. Mm-hmm. I saw, you know, uh, Rage Against the Machine on the, at the Fillmore on the record, the second record. Sure. You know, uh, White Stripe. You know, all this stuff to where I'm like. It's just like you're saying, early heroin. That was like early heroin to me to where now the adrenaline was so huge when I was young that now when I'm out, I'm like, ah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's yeah. it's strange. That's why I'm glad I found comedy because like when I saw like Louis C.K. Yeah. or Burr or something, I was going like, oh my God, this is the new rock stars, you know? Yeah. The only thing that gives me that feeling going to see shows, the only band that I think is any good live at all is... Um, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, mean, well I think there's about five, man. Tool, still doing it, you know. Um, Radiohead I saw recently. But, uh, yeah, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, man. I saw him on the uh, Do You Love Me tour. Yeah. And I try to explain to people, when you see true artists like, say, Rollins, to me, Rollins yeah. doing spoken word yeah. and everything he's ever done from Black Flag to End of Silence to... When you see true, real shit that's not uh, glossed by a record company, not only that, but nobody wants to sign a Nick Cave. You know what I'm saying? Well, there isn't one. There, there isn't one. But what I'm saying is when you see guys that are like, I'll do this. Uh, I don't care if it's uh, you know, signed or anybody hears it or whatever. Uh, this is what I do. When you see the real deal, it's so fucking monumental. You know, you can feel it. You know, a Lucinda Williams, uh, you know, even a Karen Finley doing fucking performance art. When you look at this stuff, you just go like, wow, man, these people, how do they even do this? You know? Well, I think that some people have an innate energy that's in them to where they're like, I don't believe in God, but there's um, where people are like touched by some sort of like magnetic you know, electromagnetic presence that they have in them that is not learnable. Right. And some people have it and some people don't. And if you've got it, um, you have the ability to be like that care, like a charismatic, you know, Titan. Yeah. You, you, you know, you, you're like, when you see Warren Ellis play on stage, yeah, it, he's like in, he is touched by something supernatural. It's or, or, or it, least it seems that way you yeah. know when you see him and then you know a lot of other bands that people like gush over i just don't see that in them yeah you know, they're they're of course they're going through the movements and they seem to be you know inspired in what they're doing but if they don't have that thing there's not like a thing in them right to where they to where you're somehow seeing through them into some unknown otherworldly dimension that you that you that scares you or that that makes your the hair on your neck well they're like these capsules of fucking uh a purity yeah that float around and what i've not studied but what i've realized over my entire life now is as much as i worship nick cave i more worship the audience because that is a group of people in each city and state and country mm-hmm. that are into great shit. They're going to be at art galleries. They're going to be at great films. And they are the small or the big mighty crew that can keep somebody like a Nick Cave uh, out yep. there and, and doing it. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So That's those people fascinate me more than the actual performer because... There, I'm sure there's some amazing artists out there that have not been able to capture an audience. I've always been fascinated by what sparks people to go out, especially in this day and age of Netflix and uh, you know not a lot of money and a and a, and a weird political landscape. Uh, it gets it's hard to get people to leave the house. So when somebody leaves the house. I'm like, wow, something drove them out enough to see that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. 
which is amazing. And that and those seem to be the right people I want to be around all my life. That the Nick Cave audience, the Rollins audience, the uh, the the Mark Marin podcast uh, fans early on. You know, it's people like that that are interesting to me. You know. Well, I hope that those aren't a dying breed of people, you know, that are waning in the world. Because, right. Um, so it, there are weird and scary times afoot. As yeah. As far as like the future of, of the arts and the future of music and the future of, um, I don't know, entertainment in general, I guess. I don't want to call it entertainment. I'll call it self-expression or, you know, I don't know if like people are going to be getting muzzled in the not you know too far away right. future Can't or say anything. you know like who knows what's going to happen but you know that like money being taken away from the arts and and people devaluing music and art and you know there's people who uh there was somebody telling me that the other day that they uh <clears throat> a, a good f- a friend of Curry's family is an art dealer here in New York and he had somebody who was showing saying that he uh owned a bunch of paintings and he was like wait a minute what you own you own that painting like no i know that painting i know that's and he goes no i have it here and he took out his ipad and he was like see this is my painting collection and he just had pictures of all these paintings in a folder yeah and was saying that he owned them (laughs) on the paintings and the guy was just like i know this is an extreme example but, but, but he was just like no you those are you don't and he goes no but this they're my paintings i have these paintings because he had like yeah and he was just talking about them in this weird way but that was it like yeah he, like i have these paintings there this is the these are my paintings and i have them and it's lunacy yeah lunacy yeah yeah, yeah. and you're just like no uh, you don't have those yeah, paintings yeah but it's the deval it's devaluing it, it's the you know? cloud life yeah you know what i mean it, not only is everybody storing shit in the cloud but they're living in the fucking clouds you know what i mean it's well like, that's where it, we're going i mean yeah. i mean what this as as sad you know i've been talking about this for a few years now to a lot of my friends i haven't talked about it publicly a lot but um i really think that the entire world everything is moving towards um people living their lives in a completely other reality yeah you a know, bubble a serious to, to, to where to where in the next 20 to 30 years you will have another be able to experience another life where you have all the money and all the mansions and all the sex and all the excitement and all the travel you want and you you can be like like total recall total except, virtual. except except total everything's going to be totally virtual and f- everything will feel like normal life but you'll be living yeah somewhere else yeah, and doing a bunch of other stuff that's completely insane you know yeah. that you could never do in your own life and we're not going to see anybody anymore. I, think, I, think, I mean, I think that's what I think that's where we're. That's what everything seems to be moving towards. That's what people want. Yeah, you know, people want to. They don't care if it's real or not. They just. I mean, and does it even matter at that point? If you're like, if you look like, you know, a slug in a bed, and you're like gray and withered up and on like an IV. Yeah, and your brain is plugged into you're this other world old. where you're 20 years Chicks old and, and walking rich. around and you're rich and you can, you know, do whatever you want. And there's like money's on trees. Lamborghini and, spaceship. Yeah, everything. <laughs> like, I mean, why would someone want to live in a yeah. in the real world at that point when the technology is available for, the, for them to live in, you know, an alternate world that's so much better? That's why another reason I love New York. It's the last city, I think... That where you're forced into uh, communication and and around people nonstop yeah. with the subways and the walking and everything, yeah. compared to uh, L.A. where everybody's in their cars yeah. and and on their phones and stuff. Uh, even though everybody's on their phones all over the world, at least here you're on your phone next to another person. At least there's a yeah. person yeah. there that could bump you to get you angry a little bit to yeah. push some emotion. You know, like hey, you just stepped on my Jordans. You know, yeah. you stepped on your Jordans. You know, yeah, on the train. 
here, I actually saw somebody talk to somebody else. And they took their earbuds off and they had a conversation yeah. on the train. Yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, it was a trip. I, I think that's why podcasts are so hot, too, because people don't like to talk on the phone, but they like to hear uh, conversations. Other people talk. So yeah. they're like, let's go back to the old days <laughs> when two people talk to each other on the couch without a TV on. Yeah, you know? we just listen to it. Let me ask you a, a question about uh, a lot of people think that the term, you know, hair metal was, um, it's like a derogatory thing that, that, that record company secretly, you know, made up to trash it once grunge hits, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's really looked at upon as like a clown and like, Oh, look at these hair metal bands and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Do you feel the term new metal is also now also the same thing. Um, I don't know. I think that I think everything goes through its period of of rising up, and then people think <clears throat> when something new comes in, people you know are out with the old and with the, with the new, and kind of trash what came before. Right. And then they do it again. And then they do it again. And then all of a sudden, it becomes full circle. It comes back. Right. You know? And I think that. Um, I don't know. I, I I don't really like the bands that um, were our peers. Right. And Who was in that era? We got like because you guys were really the the kings of that, and then there just seems it, it, it's like what labels do every time. Let's find yeah. sixteen Motley Crues, you know. Let's find twenty Limp Yeah, I mean there were there were a ton of there was a ton of stuff like that. I mean a lot of it sort of all developed at once, like Corn and the Deftones. The Deftones really tried to separate themselves from right. everything, which was the right move, you know. I think for sure because they're they were able to maintain like a longevity, you know, and, and they, um, same with corn. It's interesting with corn because they just never stopped. Yeah. They never stopped. And they also never, uh, they just manned up. I thought and was like, yeah, this is what we play. You know, yeah, and us, it's yeah. a lot like, um, uh, insane clown posse. You know what I mean? People can say whatever they want about, you know, that whole thing, but they're still going, but they're still know? going yeah. and they, and they're humongous. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, do you ever think that, like in a GNR way, because GNR was all the way at the rock bottom, you know, with uh, like the you know complete the version of like Village People version of them, you know? Yeah. Um, do you ever envision Limp Biscuit coming back like like big in America? Um, I can't imagine it would. I don't really have any expectations of it um, because I don't. I've found that I have no idea, no idea what people like and don't. Right. I don't know. I mean, I I all like I do this thing all the time where I'm like, like oh that band will, will, is going to be huge, but what do I know? Or that band's never going to do anything, or nobody's going to like that movie. And I always go, but what do I know? Yeah. Because I'm wrong all the time. Like I I have absolutely no idea what's going to work and what doesn't. Yeah. Because I'm all, I'm not trying to make anything work. I'm not trying to You're not looking at hits and stuff. No, I'm not looking at hits. I'm 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 doing what's like inspiring to me. You yeah. know, and if it happens to connect with people, great. And but I am not in I'm not in a studio trying to cook up with some producers like what what's going to be the next big thing because but partly, I mean, I'm 42. It would be embarrassing for me to try to be cooking up what the next big thing was. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, I'm, right. I'm at the age where I think that the right place for me to... Where I am right now is play a few Limp Bizkit shows every year. You know, there's there's a record that is has been in the works for a long time that it, we're, you know, not not at a place where I don't think it's going to get finished anytime soon. Maybe it will, but I'm not sure. Right. Um, uh, it's It's been a bunch of songs that have been floating around for like four years now. Um, little by little stuff gets added to it. Um, but I think that we're all into such different stuff that making a Limp Bizkit record is kind of difficult. Well, you grew up, ways. right? So yeah, because none of us, like... I'm not sure, and we don't live in the same city anymore, so right. I'm not sure what it's going to be or when it's going to come out or what, you know, what's going on with it. But um, 
it's weird to be in a situation where you're like, you know, nobody wants to hear new material anyway. Right. They're, they're like coming to the shows for nostalgia and want to hear like the old songs. So like kind of like what's the carrot for us to right. do a new record at this point? Um, if we're all interested in doing other music anyway, if it happens, it will happen at some point. Um, How was Gold Cobra received? Like, uh, it, well, that's yeah. what I thought yeah, too, I thought because it, it felt well. like, oh man, you know, this is this is refreshing. It's 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 like old school, you know. Yeah, like it, it sounded like Chocolate Starfish, exactly, or, or, or Significant Other, and it, it had just, that kind of rock star kind of cool yeah, thing. Yeah, it was the same thing. But um, I don't know. It's like we talk about a new record a lot. I don't, I, I'm not, you know, right now I'm enjoying making the records that I'm making and, you know, for myself. And if there is a new Limp Bizkit record, it'll come out whenever it comes out. Yeah. You know, uh, I, it's, I think that we were really eager to, on the heels of Gold Cobra, to put something else out. But then it just, I don't know, it wasn't the right stuff. Right. It wasn't the right material. It wasn't the right time, I guess. I mean, so... So right now I'm just like enjoying playing biscuit shows when they come up. You yeah, know, which it's a handful a year. This year it was three. Three. Yeah. Just this year only just three. Three. That's it. Last year you guys, I mean, did a lot. I'm a lot sorry. of people go like, "Whatever happened to those guys?" And I go, "Hey, just YouTube like Limp Biscuit 2010, 11, 12, or whatever." Yeah. And you see these like hundred thousand people festivals you guys are playing. Yeah. And it was a lot of people that like Guns and Roses that never got to see you, and they got to see it. You know, and yeah, it was I mean, madness. Like overseas, like the UK, we still do big shows. We actually just did a show in Indiana, which was like like tens of thousands of people singing every word and it was crazy but um we just do like these one-offs and then if we go to like russia or kazakhstan it's still 2001 there so it's like wow yeah it's, it's bananas wow you know, we go over there and it's like nothing ever changed that's you know that that is the europe thing though people that are fans are always fans mm -hmm. i mean hence the that band status quo toured for like yeah. 50 years and it was like but Oop. russia it's like really like that because wow. people are just getting a bunch of music over there for the first time wow yeah. and and yeah it's insane now now you're not doing the costumes anymore right i am i'm doing real real simple more kind of <laughs> I don't know. Right now, I'm just doing a black silhouette where I black suit and black all my skin out. Yeah. So I just the idea is just to look like nothing. Yeah, like a, just a shadow. Yeah, just a shadow. <laughs> so that's kind of. I mean, that's. I guess that I'm doing like anti makeup right now. Anti. I yeah. mean, it, 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 you got to think when you look back at your dream when you were a kid, you just wanted to make stuff and be a uh, special effects artist. Yeah, and yeah. throughout your career, you definitely were that man. Yeah, for sure. You had so yeah. many radical different looks and stuff. Oh, thanks. That shit yeah. had to be horrible on stage, right? Uh, every yeah, every, it's definitely <laughs> fashion over function, man. It's, yeah. like, you know, it's definitely a miserable experience. Yeah, you know, to have some stuff on, but it's also the only thing that like made shows different and new to me. You right. Know? It's it's part of the whole experience to me. It was it was like everything that I'm I'm doing this stuff like all the makeup and all and and all, like the music and playing guitar it's none of it's for anyone but me it's a total selfish thing you know yeah. i'm doing it just because i need to and the records i'm making i'm making them because i need to make them you know and i i think that any anyone who thinks of themselves as an artist should be as selfish they, as they could possibly be <laughs> 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 because that's where it's at like i i want my artists to be uh really selfish yeah and, and not cater to anybody but i i really like <clears throat> um when people are just have the attitude of like i make the food you eat the food yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i mean if you have that attitude it's, it's a lot like comedy i feel like i should be taking even more risks you know what i mean because there's, I'm at that fine line right now where I still want people to be like, oh, yeah, he's doing good. Let's bring him back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. you can't just go up there and complete. I mean, believe me, I, I'm in the middle of telling a story, and I want to tell more stories, but then I don't want people to go like, 
is this going to be funny? But I mean, I absolutely worship Rollins. I think he's one of the funniest guys on the planet, but not intentionally. But the way he tells the spoken yeah. word is such an art to me, you know? Well, you, you're the same way. I mean, your stories are incredible. And, and I think that, you know, some people, I, I was watching something about with, uh, I forgot what stand up comedian it was, but somebody was saying, like, just because you're funny in person doesn't mean you're going to be funny on stage. Right. You know? And I felt, I feel like you really bring who you are as a person on stage. Right. And, and that's because you're so funny to people around you and you're able to somehow transfer that energy to stage and really be conversational with the audience, even though the conversation's one sided. Yeah, you know, yeah, it yeah. It feels like you're, yeah. like you're very conversational with your audience. That's why I love coming to New York because like, I have zero money, but I'll make a little bit of money and then come here and, and spend it all to take my art further yeah. as far as like, let's, you know, let's see what happens on the East Coast you know, yeah. versus the West Coast and really experiment. And it's interesting to see what happens when you get here because there's such a different form of comedy. A lot of it here is set up punch. And it's just set up a boom, 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 boom. So when you're doing a story like I sell shit on Craigslist, you know, yeah. and there's not a joke immediately after, you have to almost train the audience like this is where I'm taking you for a few minutes, you know, yeah. and you have to have the, the courage to sit in that instead of going, fuck it, I'm ditching this, you know yeah. what I mean? It's, uh, it's an interesting field, definitely, for sure. You like, you know, you're staying, you're going to be living here part time. My wife's living here part time, and I'm gonna be like back and forth from Detroit, and she's got a place in Bushwick, so um, it's uh, back and forth from here to Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean from Detroit to Brooklyn. Let's I'll talk a little bit about Detroit. I spent some time there about a month ago mm -hmm. in your house. Yeah, absolutely incredible. And you and I have said this uh, many times. When you're on the road, you can be tricked by a city. If you were only there a couple of days, you're like, wow, I could live here. Yeah. But if you're there four days, you go, all right, I'm ready to leave. Yeah. You were looking to relocate, and you went to a few different places like Portland and stuff, and then you chose Detroit. Let's, yeah. Uh, why did you choose Detroit? And then, uh, first of all, uh, your place is incredible because of what... <laughs> That's the, the what, main reason. What I, your money gets. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to... I wanted to to be able to build out a large studio yeah, and um, I wanted to be left the fuck alone so I could work. Yeah. That's why I chose Detroit. <laughs> Detroit. I mean, Corey really wanted to, to move there cause there's like, it feels like the city's undergoing a, like a renaissance right now. But um, that also comes with a lot of opinions and you know, like, you know, are people gentrifying the city? Are they not? Are they, you know, trying to, to bring the city back? You know, there's, there's all kinds of, it's, it's a, it's a hat full of opinions right there. And, um, it's, uh, you know, my main reason for being there, I've, I've really, since leaving LA, I, I've become a lot less stressed out. Yeah. I think that my anxiety has gone way down as far as just like being able to breathe and get like several things done during the day, you know, but I'm also not, you know, I'm giving up by moving to Detroit, I gave up like a lot of the big city stuff, you know, um, like restaurants, yeah. you know, sushi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're like there, there's, there's, there are restaurants and sushi there, but they're still like catching up, you know, yeah, they're yeah. still like, they're, they're figuring it out. Yeah. You and I ate at uh, one restaurant and you said, this is the only healthy restaurant in all of Detroit. There's more restaurants than that, but that, that place is really good. Like right. there, there's, there's, there's some restaurants there that really get it and they have it together and they're, and they're doing a great job. And then a lot of other places are playing catch up. Um, and then it's, it's sort of a weird thing where a lot of, places in Detroit will say they're a Detroit restaurant, but they're not, they're in the suburbs, right. but they still claim right. there, there's, it's, it's very, a bunch, it's really blurry there. Like people's kind of like the whole, whole city. Cause white people have not lived in Detroit for a long time. Right. And now there's a bunch of white people claiming that they're from Detroit, but they're not. Right. And there's, it's this weird sort of, uh, white privilege thing going on there yeah, where yeah. people feel like they're, um, they don't want, I don't know. They, they, they're like claiming the city is theirs, 
even right. though they're not really from there. It's 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 really bizarre. Yeah, stake um, and claim like D Town and all that. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. It's 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 really sort of a bizarre thing. Um, and we've experienced like, um, you know, like all the black people there have been awesome to us. Yeah, and and a lot of the white people there have not. Yeah, that's what you're saying. You're yeah. getting a lot of pushback by some fake, like fake Detroit people, right? Like whether they're fake or real, I'm not sure. It's just it's it's a uh, it's a strange. Um, it's something I've not experienced before. Like what goes down? So it's just kind of like oh, these fucking guys, like L.A. people, that kind of mentality. Yes, yeah, that kind of thing. Like like um, like how dare you come to our city? You'll never be Detroiters, um, you know. Go back to L.A. You're not welcome here, and we. But that's a minority of people. The right. majority have been really cool and been like, "Oh, cool, you're here." Right. You know, welcome to Detroit. Yeah. And um, I don't know. It's it's a it's a strange experience, and I and I'm not sure where it comes from. It's um, but I'm. No, I don't really pay any attention to it yeah. anymore. I mean, I think I was a little taken back at first, but then I yeah, just but went, first it's kind of kind of hurt you, right? You like you move so new city. I don't know. It's hurt. It's just it's sort of uh, confusing. Confusing. Yeah. yeah. Like really, I just moved to a state. Like I'm not I'm not uh, in a gang. Yeah, it, it was a little bit confusing, and uh. I, I think that people you know have their minds made up you know, about me kind of before I got there. Right. You know, yeah. and, and who's this limp biscuit guy moving to town? That yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I really didn't think anybody was, I kind of thought that was over as far yeah, as yeah. like people even giving a shit. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. I mean, there's cool, cool stuff going on there. Interesting things. Um, i you know, it's, it's a good, it's been really great place to set up a studio. Um, I've gotten to be a really good cook because I have to cook a lot. Yeah. Because, you know, not having, you know, not having the same access to like Mexican food or, or Asian food that we had. And those were my two favorites. And, right. um, you know, Mexican town, there's a, there's a Mexican town in Detroit, but none of the Mexican restaurants are like West Coast Mexican restaurants. Right. So I'm having to like, you know, make tacos the way I would want to yeah, yeah. eat tacos. But it's been really good. I've become like, you know, a really sort of, I'm domestic, I'm becoming a, a house husband. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and become kind of domesticated in dad that way. Dad Borland. <laughs> yeah, sad dad. But um, yeah, awesome studio, awesome painting studio. Amazing studio. <laughs> yeah, Beyond, dude. A, yeah, like, we'll, we'll, I saw the No, it's full functioning. It's, oh, it's, it's huge. I saw the studio and I was like, well, this would be my house. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I would just live in this part right here. Well, just the studios is like 1,200 square feet. It's fucking badass. By itself. Your it's house more than is that. incredible. It's like 2,000 square feet, the studio. Let's talk about your house a little bit because I absolutely worship architecture. Mm -hmm. And I had always read, you know, early on, such a white stripes freak. I had read about these, you know, these neighborhoods that the rich uh, uh, automobile industry billionaires built these fucking places yeah. and like Jack White and uh, Meg live next door to each mm -hmm. other. And, and I even read that um, since Detroit was so abandoned in the last 10 years, people were buying the mansions and not restoring them, but dismantling them for the marble and the house fixtures that are in there that mm -hmm. are worth fortunes, you know, all this stuff from back in the big, big automobile yeah. world. Yeah. Our house was built in uh, 1923 by a, a cigar baron, not an auto baron, but a cigar guy. Wow. Named Henry Mazer. And uh, we're the fourth owners. It was, it was briefly owned um, by a family that owned a couple of the houses in the neighborhood and then immediately went to um, a guy named Dr. Jones, who is um, a Shakespearean actor and doctor in Detroit. It comes from a very old black family there. And he um, lived in the house for over 50 years. Wow. And during that time, um, the house was pretty well maintained, except there was some problems with the roof that I think they couldn't keep up with. Um, and ended up having some water damage, but, um, you know, we got the roof fixed, got that fixed. And you did um, it all on a TV show, right? We did a TV show. Yeah. Career was just like, like, 
we could get one of these old houses and if, if we get a show, we could get it all like, like a lot of the work knocked out at once. Yeah. And I was just like, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And she said, let's just reach out to the agent, see what happens. And like, we reached out to CAA and, um, they had us set up with like a few production companies and we met with them and I think six production companies and we met with them and found one we liked and got green lighted and, and it became a nightmare, right? That was it. Um, I think that that like doing a t television show was. But I'm just saying, buying an old house. Yeah, yeah. You know, because now everybody's saying like, you know, if you're gonna buy a house, make sure that fucking thing's done because what happens with it is like, oh my god, you know, contractors can't be around. Yeah, it was just it was a zoo yeah, doing yeah. the house, like like trying to knock out because it it was the nightmare part of it was. We shot for 12 weeks. Right. In the middle of that, we did, um, we had two weeks of, of Queen Kwong and Limp Bizkit shows. Oh, man. That we went away for, came back. Then on the last day of shooting, the next day I flew to Russia for a tour for seven and a half weeks. Oh, man. And then I immediately flew from Kazakhstan to London to meet up with Queen Kwong, to meet up with my wife. And we did a month European tour. <laughs> so I was like, basically for half the year, my wife and I were dealing with nothing but like either people in the house. We, we had to move, deal with people, dealing with people in the house, touring, surrounded by people all the time. Like, and we, and we ended up like, I was, it was rough. Yeah. Like it was a yeah, rough. Especially when you're in your forties, it's not like you're in your twenties. So you're like traveling eats you up. Then you just want to go home and lay in your own bed and you're like, oh fuck, the walls are missing. Yeah, I mean, it was just constant, like constant, like people just, it's like constantly having a bunch of people up in your shit. Yeah. You know, for a long time. And then also, um, the sh shooting the show was like really tough on our relationship. Like, really? Like, yeah. To where we were not like, there was never, I don't want to say it was tough. Like there was never a question about staying together or anything like that. But like, when you're working with the person that you are in a relationship with and you're living with them and like you're, you know, you're constantly <laughs> like all day long, never apart dealing, dealing with shit all the time. Like, yeah. like you get all this, like you're getting constant, your relationship becomes constant issues and dealing with shit all the time. Yeah. And, and we totally made it through that. And we knew like, after all that, we were like, Oh yeah, we can deal with anything. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're we're good. So yeah, that's good, man. I mean, because I've known you f through three relationships now, and I know that like, you know, like people will say like, "Well, fucking Wes, he just quits Limp Biscuit or something," but they never look at the human behind it. Because I was there yeah. when your your marriage crumbled, you know, yeah. and and and. I can't imagine, you know, you have no money, your marriage crumbles, the brutality of that. Then you meet another woman and that goes bad. And now you've got a, a woman here, right? You, you start to question yourself. Is it me? Is it me? Or, or what is it? You know, cause it's um, so hard, right? Be, being an artist. And I think just be, I think touring is terrible on relationships. Right. I think that, you know, I, I know the, the first, the, my first breakup was me. The second breakup was not, I was just, married to an asshole and um the this one is just amazing it's like the first she's the first person that i've ever respected as an equal right and that i've ever felt was more intelligent than i am and that i actually you know she really really um challenges me right. as a person you know and so i i totally respect her love working with her you know, um, I just, I mean, she just compliments me in the right way, you know, and I think it's taken this long, you know, I, I think that I always thought about like whoever I was with in a relationship as sort of like a side dish to what I had going on in my life. Well, artist you know what I mean? first, right? Yeah, artist first. And, and now I'm actually in, in a partnership where I've got somebody, you know, Kare is just like <laughs> so talented and intelligent that it it adds all this it, it it's made me like way more productive right. and, and she's been able to come in and like 
go like you're really fucking up in these parts of your life like, and, and, and <laughs> she's like, fixing you yeah she, she just like came in and and has been like like you're you're way more you're better than this yeah you know and you're not challenging yourself and you need to be you know that's awesome challenging yourself and and outputting i mean she's the reason that i that i've sort of stepped up and started outputting more and you know and and thinking that more things are possible well you're 42 man it's yeah. you, i mean you know if you look at limp Bizkit, it's only a small part of your life i mean it's yeah. a lot of years but really you know when i look at when i played music it is it is so i think i stopped in 06 but now it feels like such a oh, uh, 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 like so long ago. Yeah. I barely even remember it because yeah. comedy is just such my life. You know, I look at the early life of school yeah. and and rock concerts and fun. That's my whole early life. And yeah. then the from fucking then all for twenty five years it's music mm -hmm. and now it's comedy. And you, you got so much further along that you could do anything. Yeah. You know, that's I mean, my whole point of like when I started comedy, I tell people you can do anything. Even yeah, if you were in a life. you were in a giant yeah. rock band, you could become a full blown fucking, you know, architect or a realtor or a painter or anything. And yeah. you would be like, I meet guys all the time. They go, Oh, that guy used to be in docking, you know, now he's fucking like a successful such and such or whatever, you know. Yeah, and that's sort of what I'm excited about because I I think that part of my life I, I think like the Limp Bizkit songs, I don't even feel like I wrote them. Right. Like when I play them, I feel like I'm in a cover band or something because I don't even, they, they're, it's so long ago. Just like, a different per human back then. I mean, I haven't changed that much as far as artistically, I haven't changed that much, but to, but it's, there's been so much material written since then and, and now. Yeah. That, and I wrote that stuff when I was, you know, between 21 and 26. Yeah. And it's just like, I don't know. That That's the other thing is that, sort of like one of the issues of, of, of that being the case is it's like if everyone remembered you for the haircut you had in high school yeah, yeah. forever, <laughs> that's what it's like. It's yeah. like, that's your identity That'd be me. forever. It's junior, like, as a junior with the perm, I was yeah, Sammy Hagar. Era. Exactly. You know like, I mean? and, and if everyone were, if everyone from like then on that knew you like for your public persona was like, Hey, here's your 11th grade Sammy Hagar picture, Dean. Happy yeah. birthday. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and everybody's like, Oh, that Dean, he's got yeah. that big hair. And yeah. you're like, no man, I'm like, they wouldn't even recognize you now. Yeah. But that's what everybody knows you as. And that's sort of like having a snapshot of your life being, you know, sort of put in the history books yeah. or whatever. That's, that's, um, I can relate a lot to what you talk about because I do remember specifically when, uh, you know, this rock era, my era was mm -hmm. getting, uh, completely labeled and starting to go down, downhill. I wasn't even, you know, there was people that were trying to hold on, you know, like, I don't know what's going on that, that old, there's no good music anymore. I can't mm -hmm. stand people yeah. like that. I immediately just shaved my head. You know, like I had fucking gray almond hair and yeah. sideburns. I go, this yeah. is out of here. You know what I mean? Just yeah. so I wouldn't be boxed in. And oh, yeah. Just, I came home sure. from Cabo. I went to Cabo, played music, came back. I remember specifically I was in Cabo and got like a $5 haircut. And is and I was like, there you go. That, I'm getting rid of Done. that. Because I just didn't want to be, uh, you know, thought of as like, you know, hair metal or whatever. Because I was so into so much stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. To me, it was like, you know, Jane's Addiction was the same as Guns N' Roses to me. and Because uh, it I, reeks like of people like that just, you, you, you go like, you don't get it, man. Like, yeah. like you're, like, it's the equivalent of like somebody talking about how life would be different if they had got, had, you know been the quarterback yeah you know oh, or, or, or like people. people reliving the glory days yeah. like you, you don't want to love ever, to relive the glory days yeah you don't want to relive the glory days i talk to people and i'm saying this over and over on the show most people only love music from it's a memory it's a time machine back to when they were single with no bills 
mm. or, or when they first got laid or anything. There's not a true love of music. It's a love of an era of their life. That that reminds them of. That's all it is to yeah. them. It's a transporter back to like, oh, I didn't have kids. I didn't marry the wrong woman, yeah. you know, and all yeah. that. And those are the people that say there's no good music anymore. The people that are like me or you that are constantly uh, evolving and listening to uh, new stuff or finding yeah. new stuff, it's a whole different... It's, you can't compare the two people, you know? It's pretty Yeah, bizarre. I think that the difference now is, I think, just people need to be really aware of the what danger music is in yeah. and what danger the arts are in, in yep. a whole new way. Yeah. That, that, that um, you know, that, that we're really losing like some important things. Not that it's not, not that there isn't good art out there because there's a ton of it. Right. But people are not, you got to um, support it. Valuing it. You got to support it. And they're not paying it, yeah. attention to it. You know? I always tell people when I come to town, they go, Oh dude, I'll catch you next time. I'm like, there might not be a next time. I'm yeah. 51. I could die. I could not get booked here again. Yeah. Uh, you know, all kinds of shit could mm-hmm. happen. You got to have some urgency. For, for what you're in for art, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's the one problem of giving this podcast away. I always ask for donations, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it's not because, you know, it's not for the, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to get rich from donations. Yeah. It's like, is this turning you on? Do you, do you get something from the show? Then donate because... Like NPR. Yeah, contribute <laughs> like- back because... This world of free music and free, uh, you know, I, I stole this on the internet and all that mm-hmm. is is the complete cesspool of uh, it's just going, you know, in a bad circle, you know. Yeah, it's it's it was interesting with Crystal Machete. I put it out on TuneCore, yeah, just to see what would happen, you know, and and getting to see like my numbers every week and getting to see like the Spotify plays and what the sales are. I mean, it's I've made my money back from what I spent on it, but it's um, it's uh, sold less than you would expect. Well, you made your money back, yeah, but exactly, not yeah. in man hours and years of learning an instrument and years of being on the road away from families and all of that. Yeah. You, yeah. You, 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 you never get that back. You don't do art for money, but people just the, the, in their mind, it's just like you said, you made your money back. Just and, what I put in. Right. It. Exactly. But, People that don't look thing. at fucking yeah. all the way back to fucking eight years old trying to learn the fucking instrument. Your yeah. fingers hurt, shitty jobs, losing friends because you're rehearsing all day or yeah. whatever. They don't look at the whole lifespan. It's crazy, you know? Yeah, it's that, that whole thing. There's like a, there's, there's like a, I don't know, cartoon or maybe it was a New Yorker cartoon or something where somebody was like, like, here's the drawing for your ad. And he was like, why should I pay you this much for something you did in 10 minutes? And they were like, because took, it took me 10 years to learn how to do it. <laughs> exactly. Well, it took me 10 years to learn how to do it in 10 minutes. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, That's like telling a plumber that. Plumber gives you the bill and you go, oh, why should I pay you? you know? I mean, you were here four minutes. Yeah. The guy's like, I'm a journeyman plumber. You yeah. know what I mean? Why don't you just hire the guy that's been doing it for two weeks then? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. See what why happens. Why don't you do it yourself? What's the apartment flood, yeah. you know? Uh, I know you got to get rolling. Uh, just a couple more questions. Let's get into your guitars real quick, because I always get uh, guitar nerds on here, and they love that. Um, when I first met you, uh, you were you had this um, kind of semi-hollow body that uh, I think Yamaha was making mm-hmm. for you. It yeah. was going to be your new model. Yep. And you were also playing... Uh, Ross had given you a Jackson Randy Rhodes, 81. which, which yeah. I fucking worshipped. Yeah, you were playing that. Yeah. What a great guitar. But um, And then you played Paul Reed Smith for a while, and uh, oh, you've been all over the board. Yeah, I've, I, I think that I just sort of like things for a while and then move on to something else. Um, like now, I'm, I'm really into... Like, this is the golden age of the guitar right now. Like, there are so many companies, especially with the popularity of, like, offset guitars right now, like Jaguars and Starcasters and Jazzmasters and all the different sort of incarnations of them and all the different companies that are making that stuff. Um, it's, It's just, like, people are trying so many different things right now and have such good taste when it comes to, like, 
taking all the elements of the last 50 years of guitar building and making these like beautiful hybrids of all like the highlights from all the best guitars right and just trying new things and the, there's so many pickups and so many effects pedals and like now is the best time to be a guitar player that there there's ever been because but, but also the worst <laughs> the worst yeah i mean but but as far as like yeah the amount quality of people, equipment, the quality equipment I mean, look at and, that. and yeah. the the experimenting and the people like what they're trying to do and the way guitars are put together and just like the thoughtfulness behind it and the imagination behind it. It's like the best time ever. Did those wise. Yamahas ever come out? Yeah, they came out for a while um, and were popular, but Yamaha is a strange company because yeah. they, um, they're, they're very Japanese yeah. and they, and um, they have very different ideas about what they want to pursue. They're, they think they thought the future of guitars, because Troy Van Leeuwen and myself and um, they had like Aaron North for a little while, and they had the dudes from Mastodon for a little while right. that they were working with, um, and uh, all they were asking all of us um, what we what our opinions of guitars were in the future guitars, and all of us were saying like it doesn't need to be reinvented like it, you you got to you know make really cool vintage inspired guitars you know that have these things that aren't broken that's what everybody wants it's just like if you if i could shake gibson and just say stop trying to make these dumb new yeah. self tuning oh, things yeah, you know right. like we talked about they need to make like four guitars yeah. five guitars that's, that's it the, just like the, and make them the best. They made the best guitars ever made. Yeah, and then, ever. and now they and and Fender did it too. Yep. And, and and trying to make new versions of like it just doesn't. That's why I like about all the boutique companies is they're doing what the main companies should be doing. Yeah, they're making, Echo Park guitars. Yeah, Echo Park guitars, built guitars. Like there's there's just really cool companies. Um, that are that are indie companies that are doing things right. Yeah. And Yamaha asked they 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 Mike Tempesta, a really good friend of mine, was the a like he was the artist relation guy there, and he brought all of us in, and was really trying to steer to the LA office, and was really trying to steer the company in a cool direction um, that would have been, you know, had integrity. Yeah. Because you know? Yamaha had some really cool guitars in the '70s, as did Ovation. But they just lost it. They started like moving towards like graphite necks and yeah, carbon yeah. fiber bodies. And yeah. what's the future of that guitar? Old, like a spinoff of Steinberger and stuff like what's yeah. going, Parker Fly and all that. Yeah, Remember I mean that? Parker Fly is a, a good guitar, but it's wrong. Like yeah. it's it's the wrong direction. Yeah, wrong guitars. shape and stuff. I mean, it's Hurts cool if you're Al Demiola or something. Yeah, yeah, or Alan Holdsworth. Alan Holdsworth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, or if you're Trent Reznor, <laughs> you know, like nails that play those Parkers for a long time but i just don't think that um that was the future and they wanted to yamaha the japan japanese office at yamaha thought the future was lightweight guitars that lit up like ipods right you know yeah. and and it's not no you know they they that's not what people want that's not the direct because this was like i don't know this was like late 2000s right and it was like everything was screaming vintage then like yeah. like classic oh yeah well, well you know, murphy like, pauls and relics were bigger than ever yeah and and, 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 and that was genius shit yeah and we were just like no man it's got to be classic you gotta you have to have timeless yeah you know timeless classic shapes and they just didn't want to do it yeah they they, they they didn't believe us and they wanted to focus on like cutting edge lightweight all, like alternate materials your model was incredible well, thanks it was i it, mean it was fucking based quality heavily of off it. of Starcast, right you know? but the quality of it was fucking smoking yeah they made they made really good guitars yeah made me some really good guitars and they had it for a while and then they discontinued mine discontinued troy's discontinued all of the you know the model they they kept adding like weird things to classic shapes they would be like we want to do a classic shape, but have like this weird modern thing on it. And I was yeah. like, stop it. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah. like, like stop messing it, it up. Had GPS. <laughs> I got yeah, you to your yeah, next gig. Like, yeah. Stop doing that. But, um, <laughs> I was like, why can't you just 
make like it's not broken and yep. you're not gonna make it better nobody wants automatic tuners i don't you know i look at side of companies and i just think how fucking dumb are you it's the easiest thing to do you've got massive history you've got incredible shapes you get a big star and you get the incredible shape and high quality and you go hey I'm West Borland, and I play this fucking Yamaha. And, and they it, already have Slash playing the yeah, Les Paul. Why right. are they going to make like a self-tuning thing that models a bunch of different guitars? You got a fucking kingpin playing the guitar. Just show the. It, it doesn't drive butts into the fucking seats at Guitar Center. You know what I mean? It's like you know what does a '59 flame top? Every time you show fucking Jimmy Page, you show Joe Perry, you show Joe Walsh, you show Slash. You go, oh, okay. And then every time you see a strat with Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, all that shape. Yeah, it's the like advertising is done, man. Yeah, it's done. done. Just concentrate on kick ass guitars. The quality. Yeah. You know, and the they woods just are spread themselves too thin. Yeah, and, yeah. And then that's uh, it. But yeah, now I'm I'm really into built guitars. They I mean B I L T. Um, they just they're doing what I was just talking about, you know, making really great quality guitars i'm still with kind of in the fender umbrella to where i've got a good relationship with them like yeah. jackson charvel fender Ovation, love that EDH, shit. gretch like that whole they fender kind of owns all those companies and that's where mike tempesta my buddy at yamaha went, went over there and i followed him over there and um i'm you know live i'm using a lot of um like uh kind of cheaper like mexican and chinese uh fenders and i upgrade to lawler pickups and just like for touring so you don't yeah, care for touring yeah so i can just like throw them around and right. be rough with them and um if anything happens i pull out the you know pull out all the expensive guts and guts get a new and body put, put put them on the new guitar but um yeah i i'm really into that i mean i'm really into um i mean most of my money goes into microphones and compressors yeah. and album recording stuff and recording neve yeah. shit stuff like that yeah, yeah. now uh last question uh, you know <laughs> I, I remember specifically one time i was uh i was just like jammed with you guys like fred wasn't there so i got on i was gonna do uh you know one of your, one of your tunes and i realized i was like i this is such a different machine from what i've played there's no power chords or anything you know what i mean like when you were playing your playing is not it, it, it's it's definitely a completely different era and i think that it's not talked about a lot of these eras of like say adam from tool or tom morello or yeah. you uh, it seems to stop after Ingve. You know, you go like Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, Ingve, Sweet Picking Era, yeah. Steve Vai and stuff. And then nobody talks about these other atmospheric style guitar players being like Adam from Tool yeah. or Tom Morello. Mm -hmm. First time I saw Tom Morello, I was like, well, what is he playing? You know, like, is that a guy playing a guitar when you first hear it? Yeah. And then you see him and you go, wait, he just pulled the, the, the cable out and he's rubbing it on the strings and put it, you know, and then yeah, when I see in, you, yeah. I'm like, this stuff is not talked about at all as guitar playing, which really blows my mind. I think it will be. Right. Maybe. Um, but who are your guys is what I'm trying to get to that got you to that? Because how do you even start playing like that? Are you just emulating DJs? Is that, is that what your thing was? Um, for me, it wasn't DJs. It, it, I think Tom Morello was kind of doing the DJ thing more. I mean, maybe I was a little bit like for a little while influenced by Tom Morello. But for me, it was mostly Les Claypool and like Paige oh, Hamilton oh, yeah. from Helmet. And oh, of yeah. course, Hetfield's right hand. And then... Um, God, outside of that, I mean, a lot of, I really liked, you know, electronic stuff like Aphex Twin and Square Pusher and, um, Kraftwerk, you know, stuff like that. After that. Later, gotcha. Yeah, a little later. later people that would, pushed it even people further. People were there, like, like the Square, Chemical Brothers? Square Pusher records. No, more like, more of the stuff that was coming from, um, like Warp Records. Gotcha. Like, like the stuff that was like, like all Tecker or all Tetcher or however you want to pronounce that, but stuff where people are like splitting and cutting and you know making all these crazy loops and i was like working with lethal a lot then so i was a lot of the time 
was sort of like playing off of him because he would have like a loop or something and I was I would try to you know um echo back the loop that he was doing you know right like, like, like come a bounce up. back yeah well just try to like make a guitar part sound like it was a loop you know or, right or, or or make it sound like a sample you know or make it sound you know like like it was uh one of the really cool things about Square Pusher is that guy's a, a drummer and a bass player, and he was uh, he would sample himself playing and then right. like cut all that up, and it just sounded insane, you know. And that's, but um, as far as playing, it was it was Paige Hamilton, Hetfield, Les Claypool, Pro, uh, Tommy Victor, Prong. Yeah, I really liked him a lot. Um, I've never been good at soloing. I, I've 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 never been never wanted to do that like i i was always more into to like riffs and right. i always thought solos were just i don't know i i know i kind of fell in the era of that being the thing but you know where solos kind of got dropped out of songs for a while guitar solos i just always thought that was too flashy or too uh, like too much of a show-off right thing right in a way not that I'm coming from the guy who's like <laughs> dressed so like <laughs> extravagantly on stage well, and like spotlight on me. Also, but, uh, it's looked at as like a different era. You're taking music somewhere else. You know what yeah, I mean? like, I'm just trying to do the something format. Else with the what are we going to do? The format of the verse, chorus, first bridge, solo, chorus. You yeah, know, I yeah. mean, you get away from that format. You know. Uh, uh, but I mean that whole thing of like thump boom bum thump boom bum thump boom but you know it's just rad. It's like it's it's like my name is Mud, all that kind of fucking stuff. Yeah, just the two hand tapping stuff and just how he like basically like all the things that Les was doing on bass. He just was like like you're not supposed to slap on a fretless. And he was like I'm slapping all over the fretless, and it, yeah. it sounds stuff that I think sort of breaks the rules and sounds wrong. And approaching the guitar and the bass or I mean, for me, it was mainly the guitar, but approaching it just in a different way. Yeah. You know, you, know, you miss to get something out of it. No. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always like that. You know, I mean, I, I, I like in some ways, I think that I think that he's super talented. Yeah. You know, but I don't think that um, he and uh, us were a good mix. Right. I think that he was, you know, um, angry about a lot of stuff. And and I don't think that it it just there's too much um, I don't know too much like tension and right, animosity yeah. and and I think that he's probably happier doing what he's doing now yeah you know and I think we are too well fuck man I'm glad we got to sit down and talk dude yeah pretty crazy oh well, what well, about Bungle dude well, that could be one of the greatest right. Oh, Mr. Bungle? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, mean, always I was heavily talk... influenced by Mr. Bungle. Yeah, I always wanted sure. to talk Mr. Bungle with you, and I always forget because, he, you know, Mike Patton, as much as people talk about Trent Reznor, I feel that Mike Patton is the absolute underdog genius of our uh, you know, oh, last, totally last 30 years. I mean, you know, to me, people always talk about, you know, I worship Angel, uh, Angel Dust, and and then of course this new Dead Cross, you know. But Mr. Bungle, man, seeing it, my buddy Fletch and I would see him all the time. And we'd go to the shows and we'd be like, "How do you how do you do music like this? This is fucking, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like insane. It's, it, well, it comes from that John Zorn school. Like I was a huge, I was hugely influenced. I mean, I should say that John Zorn was as big of an influence on me as Claypool or, or Patton or you know. When I say Paige Hamilton and Tommy Victor and of James course Hetfield, I get it for the like, surgical those guys are just like the surgical like even Dave Mustaine like his yeah. his riffs and Incredible. playing you know and it's not stuff I listen to now but it definitely had you know a huge influence on me as a teenager yeah um, but John Zorn is is I don't know if you're familiar with him yeah. but he's a New York saxophone player that. Um, uh, has used Patton for years, and Patton really came from Patton and and Secret Chiefs, and um, just that whole school of people have that uh, just that craziness, that like ADD, completely insanity, completely you know, to where they're changing gears constantly, like Phantomos. Yeah, yeah, the oh. whole thing, like they're taking it to the nth degree, and you know just. It's so cinematic and so incredible and so um, 
diverse. And that's what really, I think that stuff, Zorn and Patton were for me like a huge uh, wake up call, not even a wake up call. Cause that a very, very, this was a wake up call for me at like 15 or 16. Yeah. And I was yeah. just like, Oh, that that's okay. I can be any way I want. I can do as many projects as I want. I can have as many different sort of sides to me as I want to show. Like, I don't have to be just one thing. I right. can, I can, you know, and that's why I'm, I'm making three records right now and all three of them are different. And I think that that's fine. Totally. You know, and I don't feel spread too thin because uh, I've created strict parameters for each record that I cannot go outside of to ensure that they're all different. Right. You right. Know? And, and I feel like I'm way more creative with those tight boundaries on myself. You yeah. Know, I, I just, and bungle seems to have their own, it seems lawless, but it seems to have its own like set of its own like set of, uh, you know, laws of, of physics or whatever that it has to like be within. Yeah. Somehow. Like, I don't know what they are, but I'm sure that there's, it's incredible. All something. the music yeah. that came out of NorCal. When you look at like Metallica, Bungle, Primus, all the, same time. all the same time and, and all the same audience going to all of it. They're not going like, Oh fuck this Bungle. They're like Bungle, badass, faith yeah, no more I mean, cure. Yeah. When you, it, it's hard to like, I hate saying this cause I sound like an, old fart but yeah. like to to be able to experience something like Lollapalooza yeah. and to see all the different bands who are all existing all at the same time and everybody liked them yeah and then like God, I remember Karay and I were we, we were on tour like last year or the year before in London and we were watching the Glastonbury feed like right the, the Glastonbury was all the bands from Glastonbury and we were just like what <laughs> yeah like band after band just going like huh like and just well that's I, the trust in the promoter uh who was perry farrell who's not a promoter yeah, so yeah. when you take that or even ones that i i, I worship uh uh, Lollapalooza, and at the same time, I would go to the Horde tour with the fucking you know Black Crows, Hippie, Grateful Dead, yeah. Mother Hips scene. When you have people that actually are doing it for a uh, a positive way of like this is how the music is and yeah. the scene and the culture and everything, instead of like this is how we sell tickets, you know that's what a Glass yeah. and Berry is, and that's what uh, all these festivals are. I just now. I don't know. There's something like there's there's two things going on in music right now, which I'm which confused me. One is there's kind of an anti-talent movement yeah. where people think that there, there's like a whole group of bands that have this, how do I say this exactly? They have this like very naive and unconfident way of presenting themselves, right. which seems to attract people in kind of like a, like I like your band because you're me. Yeah. Type of thing. Yeah. And then that, and there's people sort of following all these bands that obviously haven't played their instruments for very long, obviously are, are kind of like, will have some like, like cute guys and girls in them. Yeah. And obviously aren't going to be doing it very long. Yeah. But, but they, 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 they're kind of like hip looking yeah. and they're like, some of them are good looking. American Apparel Rock. Yeah, to where they're just like, like we're just trying this out, and we wrote these songs, yeah. and we hope you like them. And they don't really have songs, but they have a following, like yeah. a huge, huge following, huge. because there are people who are just like, I feel connected to these bands, yeah. and it makes me feel like I could do it too. That's going on, and then there's this whole like, I mean, Gina at work has a band. I, I'm not gonna get, you know what I mean? It, it, she who? shouldn't be doing right. I'm just saying, like when you're wherever. Oh, you, Gene at work. Yeah, you're yeah. Just like yeah. whoever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh yeah, they're huge now. You're like, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. There's a lot of that going on. Yeah. So this whole that whole thing's going on, and then there's this other thing going on where music is just a lot of music is just not aggressive. Yeah. Like yeah. like where where people are. I think it kind of goes along with the whole sort of politically, everything needs to be politically correct right yeah. now. And people are afraid to like create ripples or, yep. or do anything that could be seen as um, 
offensive. Like they want to be very non-offensive and very. That's why I love you know, Eagles of Death Metal. They're like eat yeah, dicks, yeah, eat dicks, yeah, you know I mean? yeah. I mean, but they're older. Like I want to see some younger bands. I hear you. I you hear know? you. Absolutely. I wanna, I'd, lo- I'd love to see some younger bands kind of get that and maybe the current political climate will inspire that i don't know i hope so uh, you know but. i hope so that's usually when you, we get the best music the 60s movement of the of the hippies to you, know, to you know tap out or whatever and then and then the 80s of reagan era you got the great comedy and the metal yeah, and we just came off eight years of obama so yeah i guess that now inspired a lot of complacency soft rock <laughs> soft rock yeah a lot of soft rock well God, I hate to I hate to think that this is what we need to have like some Yeah. I don't know. Some some gusto put back in the music, but I'm there, man. Thank you, dude, yeah. for doing the show. Thanks for How having great me. was that, man? To have it see you in New York. I feel like you and I uh, for the rest of our lives will land in different spots and uh it was so cool to see you in Detroit and stay at your house and have yeah. dinner with you. It's like I love that more than anything that I've ever gotten out of music, it was uh, long relationships with people and stuff that we have shared together, like going to uh, Prague and the Eastern Bloc. Yeah, that is crazy. something yeah. I will even though you think it's bad and good. It's some it's an emotion that sits in your brain and it, and we will never forget that and that up in Marin at the site and yeah. all that. You know, I mean, yeah, it's it's this is this whole thing is. You know, mostly I think about relationships and about sort of, you know, being a human and putting a flag up and saying, like, this is what I like, this is what I believe in, and I want to meet other people who believe the same yeah. thing. Yeah, I believe that, too. That's why I'm so glad to have you on, uh, because I, I, I don't believe in people... Uh, being whipped down for success it 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 irks me you know what i mean and well, it's, it it will always happen and it will always happen yeah. yeah and i've i'm i'm not completely innocent of you know being jealous of somebody else's success either yeah you know, i gotta watch that myself i hear you i hear you. it's a it, it's a it's a, a an evil that's why i always say my new thing is always like you know uh promote what's great not what you hate yeah the more and more you talk about what you hate, you're giving that person some more glory. Yeah. And that just is, you know. Well, the biggest thing about like living, living your life like that is you end up, um, especially like feeding into like negativity or just like online stuff or like what people think about you is it's not that it's not what they're saying and it's not like what your reaction is to it. If there's any, it's about, um, that taking up time in your in your life when you could be putting yourself towards like positive things because i i more than anything my time is the most valuable thing to me yeah you know and, absolutely and anything that takes up um my time needs to be something important and not yeah, like man. something petty yeah it's like fuck all that you know i believe in that thanks dude uh yeah. you got do you got social media yeah. Oh, I'm just checking just yeah. to get, drive people to it. What do you uh, got? It's uh, barely ever on Twitter. Barely it, on it, Twitter it's, dot it's, com. It's, yeah, <laughs> barely ever on Twitter dot com. No, I took all social media off my phone. Right. So yeah. It's, I, so it's West Borland. West Borland on Twitter. It's the West Borland on Instagram. And, um, you know, I'll post more when the records come. Next yeah. record's coming out. Of course. Know? Yeah. Movement, you know. Yeah. It's, all right, thank you, dude. Yeah, uh, so good I'll to see you. I'll see you next time. Yeah, hell yeah. See you guys later. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Left to Be Talked. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. That's how we keep the show in the top 100. Do it. See you guys. Candles lit. <laughs>